and uh, go before this lesson from Jonah. Jonah is a wonderful story, and I hesitate to use the word story because sometimes we think a story is not true. This is actual, or actually an account of what actually happened with Jonah in his life and with the folks of Nineveh. Now, it's four chapters. None of the chapters are long. The entire book can be read easily in just a couple of minutes. And we're going to have one point from each chapter. And I don't know how much study you've done of the book of Jonah or, or reading the book of Jonah, but there's a lot of other points that can be made. But tonight, we're just going to look at four points. I'm going to pull one from each chapter and see what we can do to take something home tonight from this lesson. Chapter 1, where the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city. Cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And what did Jonah do? He rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Very specifically pointed out, he's fleeing from the presence of the Lord, trying to get away from the presence of the Lord anyway. So he went down to Joppa, found the ship which was, which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. It's stated twice, trying to get away from God. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. And then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Isn't it interesting what things we find valuable when our lives are threatened? But Jonah had gone down below the hold of the ship, laid down, and fallen asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots so that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us now. On whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and from what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So they said to him, what should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to the land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us. For you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. And then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Now that's the first chapter. Point number one. You can't run away from God. And the response to that is, duh, doesn't everybody know that? Well, no, not everybody knows that. I mean, we read about Jonah, and it's obvious because he was in a position and, and is taking the position of actually physically running away, trying to get away from, as it's stated twice, the presence of God. And we look at this and we say, oh, Jonah, you shouldn't have done that. But what I see us doing sometimes, just because we're human beings, is, is really pretty much the same thing. Now, we might not physically flee to someplace else, but how many times have we read something in Scripture and we said, well, that's exactly what it says, and I know that's what it says, and that's what God wants me to do, but I'm not going to do that. You ever said that to yourself, or you ever heard anybody say that? I know that's what it says, but... Now, tell me, what is that but running away from God? You see, this book is 3,000 years old. This is a 3,000-year-old account. But human nature hasn't changed a bit, has it? We still hear what God says, and we have a tendency, if it's not comfortable for us, to run away. Now, there's a lot of things God says, and we run to that because we agree with that. 
But faith is what has to come in when we find ourselves facing something God says that we don't really want to do. That's when faith really takes over. I don't see people as necessarily faithful when they read what the Bible says and they agree with that and they like that and they do that. The people's lives that seem to express great faith to me are the ones who read something and they say, boy, that's, that's going to be tough. I don't really want to do that, but I'm going to do that because I know it's the will of God. By the way, who did that in Scripture? I believe it was Jesus <laughs> facing the cross. He said, Lord, if it's within your will, let this cup pass. How many times did he pray that prayer? Three times in the garden. Did God let it pass? No, son. This is what you're sent for. This is what you know you need to do. This is what's going to happen. And Jesus said, above everything else, let your will be done, Father. And that's exactly what Jesus did. So we cannot run from God, even though we might want to. Just a quick something from Acts chapter 9. I don't know how many of you remember this or, or even took note of it, because I know I read through this for years and I didn't really take note of it. I, I sort of knew and I think subconsciously I filed it back in my mind that this happened, but it, it didn't really stand out for a number of years until, boom, I realized what was going on. Uh, Acts chapter 9. This is the chapter where we read about the conversion of Saul. Saul, in the first part of chapter 9, is on the road to Damascus. He's going there to persecute Christians, persecute the church. The Lord appears to him. Paul is, or Saul, rather, as he's called at that point, is struck down by a, the light and the power of the presence of God, and he's blinded. Well, he's going to go on into Damascus. But look at verse 10. There was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here am I, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go into the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. How do you think Ananias felt about going to see Saul? I don't know about this, Lord. Are you sure? Almighty God in heaven who spoke everything into existence, are you sure this isn't a mistake? That's essentially what he was asking. And isn't that what we ask? Isn't that what we say? Isn't that what we proclaim? When we read what God says, we understand what it says, and we say, yeah, but. I'm going to do something else. I, I think it's pretty much the same. Well, you know the story. Ananias went ahead, and he taught Saul the gospel. Saul responded to the gospel, became Paul, the apostle. How much of the New Testament did Paul wind up writing? Now, we say we know he wrote 13 letters in the New Testament. He may have written Hebrews, but at any rate how much he wrote was about half about half of the New Testament what if Ananias had gone and found the boat to Tarshish now, he might have wound up in a fish too but Ananias didn't do that so we might forget about Ananias and remember Jonah because after all if a guy spends three days in a fish hey that's something to remember <laughs> incidentally what's really more memorable memor what's really easier to remember about Jonah <laughs> The fact that he spent three days in a fish or the fact that he finally went and preached and 120,000 people repented? You see, to me, whoa, 120,000? Well, we're coming to that. Back to Jonah. Remember the first point, you can't run away from God. So we might, want, not as, might as well not try it today just as he did then. Chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord. You think he was in distress? Can you imagine being swallowed by a fish? What would you think your end is going to be now? I mean, you, you've gotten past the teeth already, but here come those digestive juices. Good night. I don't even want to think about it. I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol, or from the depth of the grave, and you heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep, 
into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains, and the earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to me into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord, so Jonah says, even while he's inside the fish. And when he said that, said, Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Point number two. It is never too late to repent. It is never too late to repent. Now I say that to people who are alive. As long as you're alive, perhaps I should say, it is never too late to repent. There will be no repentance once you've left this life. If we repent here, we draw near to God. What does James say will happen if we draw near to God? He will draw near to us. Does that count when you're inside a fish in the depths of the ocean? Apparently it does. Because Jonah drew near to God and God drew near to him. It's never too late to repent. If you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, don't think, man, I've been doing this so long or I've been doing it so bad or I'm in so deep I'll never get out. Thinking. That is, however, how the devil wants you to keep on thinking. I'm sure if the devil would have had his way, he would have influenced Jonah and said, Jonah, don't pray to God. You tried to run from him. Why would you think he cares anything about you now? You've rebelled against him. He's going to leave you. He's thrown you in this fish. He's put you in the bottom of the sea. He's let all this stuff happen to you. Why in the world would you think God would care about you now? All indications are God hates your guts. Oh, excuse me. I can't say guts when you're preaching, can you? Uh, he hates you so much he puts you in a fish's guts. How about that? that that's, that's good for the story. Now that might be what the devil would try to influence Jonah to think, but Jonah didn't think that way. He prayed. He prayed because he repented. And I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but God responds when we pray. In the fifth chapter of Peter's first letter, this is what he says as he brings, brings this short letter to a close. 1 Peter chapter 5 it says, You younger men, in verse 5, 1 Peter 5, 5, You younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Clothe yourselves with what? Get dressed up in humility. There's all kinds of different things we do when we put on certain clothes for it. I've, I've got clothes at home that I put on when I'm going to go work on the car or work in the yard because they're not the same clothes I wear when I, when I come to preach or when I want to go out to eat somewhere or when I want to go to hunt or when I want to go to fish. We've got different clothes for different outfits or different things we want to do. But what God says to do, and you can wear this anytime, and you better wear it all the time, is clothe yourselves with humility. And then he describes the humility. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Not just humility towards God, because humility toward God doesn't count if we're not humble towards one another. That's something I need to understand. My relationship with God is completely affected by my attitude and my relationship towards others. If we don't learn that from scriptures, we've missed something. We've got to do our best to have a good relationship with others, to have humility towards them as we have it towards God. But when he says to do that, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, for God's opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's about what we're going to see, or, or that's what we have seen with Jonah. Jonah was proud, he was arrogant, he ran away from God. God put him in a fish for three days. Worked pretty well. Jonah got his humble on. Clothed himself with humility. Repented. Called out to God. God said, all right, here we go. Fish, vomit up Jonah. And he vomited up Jonah. God gave him grace. That's what we're seeing there. But then, look at verse 6. 
Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Casting all your anxiety on him. Why should we cast all our anxiety on him, according to that passage? Because he cares. If God did not care, he wouldn't tell us. He wouldn't instruct us. He wouldn't encourage us to cast our cares, our anxieties on him. But he does. He wants so much. Now, imagine that. Think about the reality of this, that, that Peter's writing to us. The God in heaven who actually did speak the universe into existence, who formed the first man out of dirt and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the God from whom all of our lives stem and in whose hands our eternal life weighs, that God is saying to us, that God who is everywhere, omnipresent, knows all, omniscient, what's the other one? Omnipowerful, what? all those omnis. He, he's all of them. And he says to us, I care about you. If you'll humble yourself and cry out to me, I want to do something for you. I want to help you. He condescends to us, to you and to me, in our daily struggles, whatever they might be. Even if our struggles have come on us because we've rebelled and run away from him. Even when that happens, he condescends and says, call on me and I'll hear you. It's never too late to repent, never too late to pray. Back to Jonah. All right, he ran away, he got swallowed by a fish, he's out of the fish now, we're up to chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. How much has changed as far as what God wanted Jonah to do? Nothing. Now I'm sure he probably, he, he just had to look back on this at some point and say, you know, it sure would have been a lot easier if I'd have just done that the first time. Because I wound up having to do the same thing anyway. Verse 3, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city and three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk and he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And then the people of Nineveh believed in God and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Can you believe this? What was Jonah's sermon? What was his lesson? What was his message? What was his theology? What did he tell them? 40 days and y'all going to burn. That's all we're told. And they repented. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. You know what he's doing when he covers himself with sackcloth? He's, he's clothing himself in humility. This stranger from a foreign country who's been in a fish the last three days comes to Nineveh, says God's going to burn you guys up in 40 days, and the king, along with everybody else, repents in humility. He issued, the king issued a proclamation, it says in chapter 3, verse 7, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that, may, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. Aren't you glad they hadn't heard of that separation of church and state thing? Hey, king, you can't do that. We got separation of church and state. No, the king lays out a decree. We're going to repent. We're going to repent together because we want to find out if God will relent. And it says in verse 10, when God saw their deeds that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Point number three. What was point number one? You can't run from God. Point number two, it's never too late to repent. Point number three, if you do it God's way, it works. If you do it God's way, it works. 
Write that down in the notebook of your mind. Because we come to the Word of God and we see things like we've talked about already that challenge us and we might say, I, I think I might be able to find a better way or think of a better way or I'm sure I can work this out without doing that because it's difficult. I have been surprised, and probably you have too, at how well things work when I decide to do things God's way. One of the things that comes up right here, because this can be difficult, when, when you've got some kind of an issue with another person, whether it's that you've done something wrong and that's at question, or whether you think they've done something wrong and that's at question, what does Jesus say to do? He says, go to them. In chapter 5, it's if you think your neighbor has something against you, Jesus says, go to them and work it out. In Matthew chapter, did I say Matthew 5? I think I said 5. Everybody knows it's Matthew 5, don't you? You're supposed to understand what I'm thinking. It's coming out. Okay. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, if you've done something wrong, go to that person you've done it to and work it out with them and, and make it right. Matthew chapter 18, it's the reverse. If you've got something against somebody else, they've done something to you, you go to them, you work it out. That's how things begin to get worked out. How many of us really enjoy doing that? I got my glasses on, but I'm not seeing any hands. It's not fun, is it? It's not fun at all. Typically, we think, well, they'll probably forget about it. Or I'll, I'll just forget about it. I'll be the bigger person. Besides, it's fun to tell other people about it. Besides them. And that's normally what happens. We start talking about, oh, what so-and-so did to us, and, or what they think we did to them. And we, talk, we, we tell everybody about it, except the person that Jesus says to talk to. Because that's the only one that is really hard to talk to about it. Jonah went to a city that wasn't even Jewish. Have you thought about that? These were Gentiles. These were heathen, pagan people. He went to this city and he said, God says repent, and they repented. I don't know if I would have imagined that happening, but that's exactly what happened. They repented in sackcloth and ashes. The king decreed that they would repent. Now I read this and I have to wonder... Why don't I tell more people about Jesus? Why don't I tell more people about the church? And you're thinking, Marty, you're a preacher. You tell a lot of people about Jesus. Well, to some degree I do, but there's a lot of situations where I think, oh, it's probably not the time. Probably not right. There might be a better day, because after all, if I start telling them about Jesus, things could get uncomfortable. I don't even want people to introduce me, and don't you do this. If we're out somewhere together, and you see a friend, don't you say, hey, here's Marty, he's our preacher. Don't do that. Do you know how many conversations have been stifled because, oh, that's one of your good friends, oh, yeah, he's a preacher. He's a what? He's a, oh, well, hey, it's good to know you. We'll see you later. Not too many people really want to have spiritual conversations about things with, with preachers. And they, they really like me and enjoy being around me until they find out I'm a preacher, and then things change. I don't know why that is. Well, I think I do. But when you do it God's way, it works. No matter what it is, whether it's preaching the gospel or whether it's getting things right with a friend, whatever the scriptures teach us to do, that's what we should do. And I'm not saying that every time you tell someone about Jesus, they're going to go, oh yes, I love that, I want to hear that, I want to repent, I want to become a Christian. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying it will be a blessing not only to them, but it will be a blessing to you if you do it God's way. And when you think about it, why would God bless us for ignoring what he says? Wouldn't that be kind of anti good to bless us for doing wrong to bless us for neglect to bless us for fearfulness I, I just don't think he's going to work that way sometimes he'll bless us in spite of that but it will never be because of that chapter 4 Jonah fled swallowed by a fish he got burped up he went and preached people repented in sackcloth and ashes chapter 4 starts out but it greatly displeased Jonah. 
and he became angry. Why is that so? Jonah hated the Ninevites. He did not have any love in his heart for these people at all. Verse 2 says, He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. Now, stop just a minute and think about what he's saying. Lord, I went and preached the gospel to a city of 120,000. They all repented. Now I just want to die. How twisted is his thinking? This is so interesting to me because for the most part, the old covenant was not an evangelistic covenant. God never commissioned Israel to go preach the gospel to the whole world. The covenant was for them. Now, here's a situation where God says, you go tell these Gentiles they need to repent. He does it, and of course it works, as we read in chapter 3. And Jonah's upset. The Lord asked him a question in verse 4. Do you have good reason to be angry? No answer. Just as then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it, there he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. You got this? He preached to a city of 120,000. They repented in sackcloth and ashes. They're reconciled with God. Jonah's angry about that, but he's happy because now he's got a plant to keep him in the shade. woo -hoo! But God appointed a worm in verse 7. And when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant, it withered. The sun came up and God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even, even, even to death. And then the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and left hand, as well as many animals? Point number four. We'll never get it right until we think like God. We will never get it right until we think like God. If we think like ourselves, well, I don't know about you. You probably figured this out already. I can be pretty stupid, and I often am. I don't mean to be. I don't intend to be. And some of the times when I'm trying to be most careful to be, to be smart, I'm stupid, unless... Unless I align myself with the wisdom of God. And sometimes aligning myself with the wisdom, the wisdom of God simply means I need to align myself with the righteousness of God. Because you can't have wisdom without righteousness. You can't have righteousness without wisdom. You, you just don't separate the two. They come hand in hand. Jonah evidently thought he was being smart by hating the Ninevites. And God said to him, basically, you need to look at it from my perspective. Who does God care about most in the world? Now, I'll tell you, that's kind of a dumb question. That's not the question, the kind of question that I ever see God or, or Jesus asking. I know he loves the church. I know he loves those who humbly submit to him. But I seem to remember a passage in John. I think it's chapter 3. It might be around verse 16. It said, God so loved the world. Not the Jewish world, not the Christian world, not the righteous world. God so loved the world. And you and I need to understand, as Jonah need to understand, that we, 
until God came along, were more a part of the world than we were a part of heaven. And without God, we were destined to die and to perish with the world because everything in the world and all the world and all the universe is eventually going to burn. And we would burn too if not for God. God cared about Nineveh. God cares about us. So until we think like God thinks, we're not going to get it right. But thank God he gave us a book. And we can read this book, and we can realize from this book, that's how the Lord thinks about it. And the more we get our heads into this book, the more our heads are going to get squared away. The more we understand what God says, the more we're going to understand everything. That's just the way it works. Everything tends to fall into place. And it simplifies life so much more when we get our heads wrapped around the simple and yet the solid and profound Word of God. Well, that's the lesson tonight from Jonah. Are there more points that could be made? Absolutely. But this is all we're going to have tonight. You can't run from God. What was the second point? It's never too late to repent. What's the third point? See, I'm asking you because I can't remember. If you do it God's way, it works. And number four, we got to start thinking the same way that God's thinking. You can word it any way you want, but that's, that's what it's all about. Until we think like God thinks, we won't get it right. So we're going to extend an invitation tonight. We're going to sing a song. If you need to respond to the gospel, this is what we're inviting you to do. If you want to talk to me afterwards about that or talk to anybody else about that, you uh, feel free to do that. It doesn't have to be during the song if you want to do it some other time. If you need the prayers of this congregation or our help in any way, though, we want to know about it. So we're inviting you to let us know while we stand and sing this song.